you. I appreciate it. Really do appreciate Show for uh, uh, coming out here, helping us with this conference. Um, yes, James Galini, work for the Galini Group. I guess he called me an owner. Uh, it has my name, but I have a very, very uh, talented and incredibly smart. Where is she at? Where are you at, Gina? Okay, in the back. Gina Lowe uh, works with me. Now, we, we focus on special education, um, and we work primarily solely with the school systems. Uh, and, you know, in how I always explain it is uh, to people is that we like to look at ourselves as consultants uh, more than traditional lawyers, uh, even though there is a litigious uh, nature to it. Uh, we really do go in there and try to problem solve. Um, that's what all of this is really about. Uh, now, what I wanted to talk about today is something called reality checks. And so when we go into our lives, sometimes it's uh, difficult for us to sort of sit back and really consider um, words. Of course, that's what I do for a living. You know, we lawyers are wordsmiths. And, we, you know, wording is very important. Um, settlement agreements and discussion, emails, uh, and, you know, you can sit there sometimes and get into something called analysis paralysis uh, anytime you, you start uh, um, doing anything, even communication. Um, but it's something to where, as human beings, um, especially in our society, because we speak English, and sometimes English, one, two word mean a myriad of different things depending on how you use it. Um, a lot of the wording that we use today in our society has everything to do with what was established a while ago. Um, which means that as a people, sometimes it's wise and smart for us to start rethinking these things. Start rethinking how we define things and people. Uh, because maybe, for whatever reason, we're not defining it in the true nature of what it really is, okay? So what I wanted to uh, start with is special needs versus disability, okay? Now, I wrote the word in caps just so everybody could see it, but uh, I have a friend of mine that every time I email her, uh, she's an advocate in this area, uh, it's always struck me, and remember, I'm a wordsmith, so I pick up on things. Um, but Gwen Brown is in the back. Wave your hand, Gwen, so everybody can stare at you. But Gwen, every time she answers an email, um, you know, of course, it's at the, it's at the bottom of, of the work that she does. But she spells disability, lowercase d-i-s, and then ab ability is all in caps. It's little subtle things like that, that when you read it, you know, you might not notice it, but it's there. It sticks in your head. And it sort of makes you rethink. Hmm. So I really do appreciate that because I picked up on it, and it's something that uh, means a lot to me. Now, as far as special needs, special needs versus disability, and a lot of you, and, and I can tell you, special needs and disabilities at different times can collide. There's a gray area, all sorts of things, but there is a difference between special needs and what we would define as disabilities, okay? So that's important for all of us to understand. Now, I borrowed this from Terry uh, Morrow, uh, in an article that I read, because I really do like how she explained it, that it's an umbrella under, under, uh, underneath which staggering array of diagnoses can be wedged. All right? So this could run the gambit. And if you look at the autism spectrum, autism spectrum disorder, we call it a spectrum because, of course, we have one end to the other end with a variety of different symptoms, with a variety of different uh, explanations, and even some of our children on the spectrum don't even hold some of the medical or psychological definitions for that, uh, uh, that spectrum. So it's one of those things to where we have to be fluid in understanding when we talk about, when we interact with uh, our special needs and our disabled community that we sort of take into very conscious uh, consideration you know, who they are as an individual, all right? I don't necessarily like either word. That's what we have as the human society right now to define 
of these particular groups of people, okay? Um, and until we sort of figure out a better way to define it, this is what we have, but please be mindful that when you move forward, that there is a difference, okay? Now, what is disabled? This is obviously from uh, Webster's Dictionary. Uh, it's having a physical or mental condition that limits movement, senses, activities. Uh, second definition, incapacitated by illness or injury, uh, physically or mentally impaired in a way that substantially limits activity, especially in relation to employment or education. Um, and a lot of us, when we think of disability, we think of more accessibility. Um, you know, um, wheelchair ramps, uh, doors that open up, uh, things of that nature, accommodations, whereas special needs um, we tend to define it, uh, you know, as it is read here. Uh, it's a variety of things. Now, special needs is commonly defined, and I have a daughter with autism, 12 years old. Uh, she, um, I'm one of those parents as well, you know, especially early on, right, when you get the diagnosis, where they're commonly defined by what they can't do. You know, um, milestones unmet and if you think about the power of language how powerful that is when we use it and as a parent i find myself doing it frequently especially in my meetings with uh, with my own iep team that uh, you know we were constantly talking about the limitations the things my daughter can't do instead of what she can do and of course you know like i said you're sort of caught between all worlds because you're trying to establish goals benchmarks uh, things to reach for in the future at the same time in our everyday interactions we as parents especially you know the foods that are banned activities avoided all of those things and a lot of that is due to that nature of having our children exist in our world and when I say our world I'm talking about us uh, quote-unquote normal uh, people and I don't consider us normal at all especially me I'm not um, but it's one of those things to where as a society um, our children um, and then our adults they're sort of forced into our quirky world and our world is quirky you know and um, that's one of the things that I want you moving forward as you interact those of you that uh, may not have a sibling or a relative that has special needs it's something to be always mindful of okay I see a lot of students here and I think it's fantastic um, but it is one of those things you guys in high school yes okay um, it is one of those things to where uh, reaching out, befriending, getting to know those students in your school that meet these criteria. And you'll find out that they're not much different than you. Okay? It just takes a little bit of extra effort to get to know who they are and what they are, what they're about. Okay? Now that second part the minuses, and we do this all the time. I was one of them. Um, I probably still do it. But, uh, you know, we turn into those, uh, I, I mean, if you want to call them helicopter parents. Um, but it is one of those things to where when you get a diagnosis, you go to, through these aspects of, of mourning that. Some stay in that. Some move on. Some are very positive about their child's diagnosis and condition. You know, some become fighters. You know, some become advocates. You know, some, some start nonprofits, um, but all of us across the gambit are out there, you know, as special needs families, and this extends to aunts, uncles, uh, um, grandparents. You know, we all take on a different persona uh, when we receive, you know, that diagnosis early on. And hopefully, the thing is, we stay positive about this journey and where we're gonna go, okay? I pushed the wrong button. So reality check number one, we define our kids. We define our kids. Society will follow. It may take us 15 years. It may take us two generations. But the reality is we define our children. Don't allow society to define them for us. And that's sort of where we are. We're sort of stuck in that, uh, that, that middle ground right now, moving from one area to the next. Um, but I will tell you, for your particular child, and this is all individualized, you define your child. And I always tell parents, do it in a positive way. Because your IEP team, for example, 
uh, the community that you interact with, you know, they're going to listen to you. And believe it or not, your child, your special needs child, your other children that you have, that resonates with them. And then they end up carrying that definition that you establish. So, so carry that message in with you. Okay, reality check number two. Special needs rates are rapidly rising. Especially autism rates. Government funding of education and social services is dramatically dropping. I wish it wasn't that way, but it is. So my reality check is that we've got to take all of that into consideration. This is our new normal. Now I know a bunch of us are like, oh no, it will get better. Do never, ever, ever make plans based upon what may happen. You have to make plans according to what happens now. I mean, the only institution I know of that can make plans uh, about what they think is gonna happen in the future is the government with regards to their spending. The rest of us don't have that luxury. You can't sit there and say, well, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a good, like five years from now, so we'll just go ahead and our, spend ourselves into oblivion based upon what I think we're gonna make in five years. You just can't do that. So my thing is, you always plan for what your reality is now, and then, of course, if it gets better, then you're in a better position. So if our government funding of social services, which you know you see the state of Alabama, um, as far as the legislature is, I don't even think they made another, I, I, don't, I think they're gonna have to have another session, special session. Um, they're considering taking out of the education trust fund. Um, they're also, uh, they've also already cut uh, Medicaid um, some of the other agencies, uh, like uh, the vocational rehabilitative services, there's already been cuts in those areas that directly impact our children. The disability community, special needs community, um, our school systems rely upon these agencies as a partnership for our transition services. So, I mean, we're really in a, a dire straits here. And this requires us to rethink how we've been doing things. Okay? And that includes all of you kids in high school. Because pretty soon you're gonna be out there in the job force, going to college, maybe not going to college, making those time kind of decisions based upon our realities now, okay? Now, outside of governmental spending, we have our nonprofits, which we also rely upon. There is a lot of fantastic nonprofits out there my big caveat, or the red flag, if you want to call it that, is that we have so many. It's sort of like technology. We have so much. It's inundating us. It's all noise. And there are some that are out there that are now ineffective, and they're damaging. And so this is my thing. We need to clean house. It's not that the resources aren't out there. My thing is that they're not being allocated wisely. So if some of those that are ineffective and damaging, maybe they need to go away so that that funding can be re-diverted into those things that are effective. We're going to have to tighten our belt. We are tightening our belt, but these are the realities. So my thing is, and this is gonna show you how old I am, okay? If any of you, and see, I got no laughter up here. You guys, anybody know what movie this is from? What? Indiana Jones, okay, I got like one, one comment. Your parents are my age, right? Okay. Her dad probably watches it in a loop like I do. Okay, Indiana Jones. My thing with nonprofits, along with these governmental agencies, because of the cuts, we have to do a little bit better analysis than what we've done in the past. And we've gotta choose who we support, and we've gotta choose wisely. Take a little bit of time before you donate. This is still the most giving country in the entire world, the most giving people in the entire world. I mean, the government's never asked me for a donation, they just say, sort of take it. But with the things that I have freedom to choose, I give and I give freely, just like I know all of you do. But my thing is, we're now at a point in our society, in our history, 
that we have to do a little bit better job analyzing who we support, what those missions are. Because some of them, unfortunately, along with governmental agencies, have become employment factories. And they've lost sight of their mission. And they've lost sight of their purpose. And one of the things that you can do to make that kind of decision is just look at their financials, their public records, if they're 501c3s. Find out what percentage is going back to serve the people that their mission is supposedly set up to serve. Start looking around. Seeing who has a worthy cause that you can support. We have safety nets, governmental safety nets. The IDEA, special education, is a safety net. 504 is a safety net. Medicaid is a safety net. WIC is a safety net. All of these things are safety nets that we set up to help our citizens. Some, if you see here, my comparison, is just like we have, we build in the process of building, sometimes people fall. Those nets are there to catch them. But it's a temporarily uh, catching situation, okay? It's not there to just catch people willy-nilly, all right? Safety nets in this regard are temporary. We also have safety nets that are there to save us. Some of us have different conditions, different circumstances than those. That's why we have two different kinds of safety nets. You know, my thing is, we are overwhelmed and inundated right now with who is and how our safety nets are being used and viewed, okay? And so my thing is, keep that in mind because this is impacting us as a special needs community as well. Now, for government spending, I put this on there because I think we're all addicted. And that includes me. I can't, I, I own a business. And of course, you know, I'm sitting there looking at all the, uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, I don't, like if, I don't like anything longer than the Bible. It sort of tells me it's unimportant. Um, you know, just like, well, I think it's what, 600,000 pages, our tax code. Um, and I made that number up, so don't quote me on it. I don't want to get an email later. James Golini said that the tax code was, I, I just made that up. So, but my thing is this, this is a real reality. We've all become addicted to what our condition's been for the, let's say the past 40, 50 years. That may not be the case moving forward. So we have to be mindful of that. And you have to sit there and analyze yourself individually. Okay, how am I using this? What if it's not there anymore? What if you wake up tomorrow and the state of Alabama cuts even more? What are you going to do? You have to think about that. You may not have a choice. This may be forced upon us. Just like these education cuts are forced upon us. I can't imagine being an administrator right now of our school systems with all these unknowns. We don't know what our future holds, okay? Now, de Tocqueville, anybody up front, anybody know who he was? Anybody? Please? No? No. He, read a, he, he wrote a wonderful book back in the uh, early 1800s. Democracy in America. French aristocrat. Traveled, gave a fresh perspective of what the American people were like. 20 years after our beginnings. Great quote that didn't catch all of it. You get the gist of it, though. This is how he described us back in the early 1800s. Okay? Now, another reality check. We're broke. We're broke. We're broke as a state, we're broke as a country. We're in Jefferson County, so we're broke. We're broke. I'll say it again, we're broke. So, in Alabama, and if you notice, I did this little cute thing where the ALA is in orange and, you know. All right, so. In 2010, or starting in 2010, we asked the federal government to allow us to cut $10 million from special education funding. 
Now this is, the, this, is, this is always the catcher and it just confuses me. The Fed said, oh sure, we'll let you cut, but you still have to maintain the, the, the same level of providing children with a, a, a free and appropriate public education. And tell me, how is that possible? Really, it's not. You know, but that's the thing, we took the deal. But that's also why it's, it's becoming incredibly difficult to, to provide um, everything that our children need because those, those numbers keep going up and the funding keeps going down. And so our schools are, gonna ha are they're, they're being forced to work with less. That's why, for example, we partner with Culture City on two of their projects, Livebox and, and the iPads. So that as attorneys, if we, are, if we do have to go into the schools to work with the school system for solutions, if the child is a wanderer, uh, if they elope, those kind of things, the life box is there um, to assist. Uh, the iPads, you know, instead of demanding that the school go out and provide a communication device, which technically, you know, can I pull the same thing that we've all been taught? That funding is not an excuse in the law? We've all been taught that, and I can tell you, I never say that. That is not our reality. Funding is a reality. You cannot go in willy-nilly and just say that. I mean, you can say it, but that's not our reality, yeah. all right? So we partner with Culture City on that so that if there is a need, then we can fill it. And we're not demanding that the school do it. We've got to start thinking this way. Federal government has also cut additional funding for Title I and IDEA. First of all, the federal government's never funded IDEA like they promised they would, all right? But they have cut anyway. Um, current budget crisis where legislature is considering taking or they're diverting money away from the education trust fund. Uh, this is going to be the second time they've done it. You know, they always promise to pay it back. Uh, and I don't know how they promise to pay it back with our money. Try to figure that one out. But they've already cut, made cuts to mental health and other state agencies that support our special needs and dis disabled communities. And those are realities. And a lot of those we need for you know, transition services, especially inside of our schools. Um, now, I am one of these believers. Uh, now, I choose uh, in my life, uh, I follow the Christian ethic and the Christian morality. Uh, there's something that is called render unto Caesar. Okay, I like that. Now, why I like that is because I separate the two. All right, we have our government responsibilities. It has nothing to do with our individual mandate. Now, no matter what religion, culture, and I hate that because I don't believe in absolutes, so let me just say most, almost all cultures, uh, almost all religions in this world uh, have something called a golden rule. They call it different things. But this is our individual mandate. What the government does, the government does. Those safety nets is what the government offers. What about us as, as, as individuals? What's our individual mandate? What is it that we're required to do? What is it that we are responsible? What makes us a better person? With me, it's the golden rule. That's, that's the pinnacle of what we teach our children at home. Do unto other people as you want them to do unto you. And that's why, like, let's say at school, how you treat your classmates, how you treat those that you normally don't see. Your special needs classmates, disabled classmates, uh, classmates, it all fits underneath this. Now, what does all this have to do with my special needs child? See, that, that I didn't write this quote, but it, it absolutely covers me, and it's going to cover all of you guys. And you're going to get to be my age one day, and you're going to sit there and go, oh, okay, that makes sense. You guys are in the clever category, just like I was. Um, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I'm wise, so I'm changing myself. The world changes when you change you. And when enough of us change together, then the world follows, okay? Right now we're all stuck on this will. Um, every one of us have these gut feelings, uh, you know, and it's very easy to get caught up into this, this um, roller coaster of, of negativity. And I know it might sound like, well, wasn't that what you were just talking about for 10 minutes? No because I believe in changing how we look at things. 
And so I have to bring that up in order for us to move forward with a different perspective and a different viewpoint, okay? But we gotta start with us. So we must change to be that change for our kids, for ourselves, for our communities, for our country. So how do you do that? You do, you make, you create. Too many of us defer. We defer our independence, we defer our individuality, we defer everything to somebody else, governmental agency, um, e even our religion, and even our religion, what we teach in our religions is it's an individual mandate. Don't defer, stop deferring. Don't have somebody else do it, you do it. You solve your own problems for your child, okay? It's gonna make you a better IEP team member. It's gonna make you a better community member. It's gonna make you a better uh, citizen of, of this country. If we all start thinking, doing, making, and creating. And you may hear a whole bunch of no's. Because unfortunately, we, there's a lot of Debbie Downers in this country. They do not and will not think the way that you, or how I'm asking you to think, or how you currently think. But I tell you what, there's always yeses back there. Always. Because what's the problem? Does anybody know up front what this reference is? What does this mean? I know we're not on the Gulf Coast, so I'm stretching here. Anybody? Crabs are interesting creatures. You don't have to put a lid on it. You can have a, a barrel full of crabs, and they'll try to stack on top of each other to get out. But one... When they reach the top and try to get out, one gets there, lo and behold, one of them will come up there and pull it down. Happens every time. We are no different than crabs as human beings. Don't surround yourself with people that are gonna pull you down. It's always gonna happen. Don't let it. So, with your child, with yourself, you have to identify interests. And we don't do that. I can't even tell you how I I, I just constantly find myself amazed at what my daughter can do. Uh, you know, it's, it, I shouldn't say that because at school, um, she has uh, uh, verbal difficulties as far as communication. Um, but I tell you what, she can read. I don't know how that happened. She was reading before she went to school. Um, her abilities on the computer, amazing. Uh, they had to have two iPads at school uh, because she figured out how to get around all the firewalls. Um, Amazon, anybody Amazon Prime members? Okay, so you're, you understand my pain. They started a, a Prime you know, movie, uh, Prime music, that kind of stuff, except they didn't tell me that it was attached to my card. So my daughter figured that out, and over the course of two days, she racked up over $1,000 in video purchases. Well, and, and how it happened is $300 here. And then I'd call up Amazon, well, hey, what's going on here? You know, my daughter, you know, just $1.99 here, $9.99, and it just doesn't matter. She had it all in her queue. Um, so they gave me a reimbursement, and they told me, well, this is how you do your settings. It took me four times to change the settings to the point where she cannot get into it anymore. Um, but that was after $1,000 of, of charges. And uh, a very, very clever girl. But it's one of those things to where I sit there and I'm amazed, well, how does she do that? I don't know. And really, it doesn't matter. I, as her father, should take more of an interest in understanding how can I utilize that for her? How can I turn that into something marketable? How could I turn that into something that's independent? How could I turn that into something that would benefit her community, her school, her country, all of those things. How could I turn that into something that, that uh, becomes independent living, the entire goal of the IDEA? You also have to fill a need. Find a need in your community. It's out there. You just have to think about it. I know everybody thinks that the world is becoming more international. You know, that our world's getting smaller because we're making all these deals all over the world and you know, there's all these things going on. I disagree. I actually believe that we're going in reverse. I think that we're becoming more local. I think people are abandoning 
lock, stock, and barrel um, with regards to what they eat, where they shop. If you look at it, I never in a million years, you would have asked me five years ago, I would never have thought that there would be such a thing as Whole Foods, Sprouts, uh, Fresh Market that would pop up in the world of Walmart. Not once. But that's because consumers are speaking. And consumers are saying, we want local, we want fresh, we want good, clean food. That's just one example. I believe that we're becoming more local. And I think that that's a result of our world becoming so technological that I think we're starting to abandon those things and we're starting to look within our communities and we're starting to look um, closer to home, all right? So with regards to how you build a life for yourself, for your kids, your special needs kids, build a community. And I know that the special needs com uh, the community is already in existence. So what you do is you create uh, uh, a marketplace. Create your own marketplace. With the technology that we have today, I mean, come on, guys. You know, how easy is it to create a storefront online to where you're selling things that your child makes, you find out what your child is interested in, instead of your local marketplace being the only place to sell, it is now expanded. It's worldwide. Your child's gone worldwide now. And the special needs community, especially economically, has a lot of economic power. So it opens up a huge amount of doors. So there is no limitations. There's tax breaks out there for our special needs and our disabled communities. Work with your local governments to have them, let's say, gift blighted areas to you to start a community garden. Um, you know, that's one of the things that, that I really do like, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to say who she is, but she had a really good idea um, about con confronting, uh, well, I'm going to say it, Lindsay Chapman with Madison Behavior, um, where she's confronted a, a developer to try to gift an area in order for them to start a community garden, where she can use that with her students. Um, as a way for them to get outside, uh, learn marketable skills, you know, work collaboratively with the community. You know, terrific idea. Use the, the system for what it is for those tax breaks. Build partnerships. You know, for example, if you need materials, don't be afraid to go to Lowe's, to Home Depot. All of our businesses have ways that they can give to support, gift things to you, materials that your child can make, put together that you can then turn around and sell. Partner with them, don't be afraid to do it. Don't be a recluse, ask. Don't wait for Voc Rehab to do it. Reality is they've shrunk, okay? Corporate America wants to help, you have to ask. It's there. Schools have to help. But what I run into, with, especially with our transition age, uh, ninth grade on to 21, is that uh, a lot of these areas of transition services, these linkages to agencies, they're starting to, to go away. They're starting to fade. Guys, step up. Be the creators, the ideas. Confront the school with it. Don't keep asking, and that's what I love about JFK. Don't ask what, you're, what the government can do for you. Ask what you can do. Confront your superintendent, your board of ed. You know, I, I love this idea of a community garden. It fulfills those needs, the transition needs, um, other areas. Uh, it, it, there's a, so many things that you can do. Partner with your school to fill those gaps that our government and some of our nonprofits are exiting the stage on. Fill them. Our schools need you. So instead of just sitting there as an IEP team member, what are you guys going to do for me? Be the solution. I already talked about the community farming. There's another uh, um, uh, friend of mine. She started a consignment shop. And then she's using that money, part of that money, 
to help pay for uh, ABA services for families that uh, have special needs or, or they can't afford those, uh, those uh, therapy sessions. Uh, there's another friend of mine. She asked me, she goes, oh, what's my son gonna do when he gets to be an adult? And I said, well, what does he like to do? Well, he loves baseball. Do something with baseball. And I explained the whole thing about the market. You know, create a market. If that's his passion, find a way to fill that gap, fill a need. So our reality check is you gotta be the solution. Be the change you wish to see in the world. 